Welcome to day one, Rebuild Democracy, and we will start with Hacking Democracy with Digital Minister of Taiwan, Audrey Tang, and it's my pleasure to introduce them. Regularly referred by the Taiwan press as child prodigy with a reputed IQ of 180, Audrey Tang began reading classical works like the Xunqing and Tao Chekqing at the age of five, started coding with eight, learned the programming language Perl at 12. At 15, they started their own company, serving as a CTO of a team of 10 hackers. In 2014, they retired from the business world and began focusing on civic engagement, working on the collective intelligence of civil society with open source software. In 2016, the autodidact and self-described conservative anarchist becomes the youngest person ever to be appointed a cabinet member in Taiwan and the first non-binary digital minister of Taiwan. Their work focuses on how social and digital technologies can foster empathy, tame misinformation and build or rebuild stronger, more open and accountable democracies. So this is no surprise that Audrey Tang was the first name we had in mind to open this conference. Dear Audrey, we had a hard time to give a title to your talk. We could have called it the technology of democracy or technological change and its impact on society or even the power of open innovation or the future of democracy. We opted for hacking democracy because it was the shortest way to bring it to the point and introduce this day and this conference, hackers use their technical knowledge to achieve a goal or overcome an obstacle by non standard means. But hacking can also be utilized by legitimate figures in legal situations. In your case, it is all about collaborating with others to create open source solutions using publicly released data code and technology to solve social, economic and environmental challenges. Basically, you are bridging all topics of the conference and as on top, you are also an artist. I could not think of a better match than you to open the conference today from Taipei Live with us. The floor is all yours. Just for the audience to know, I will maybe pick a couple of questions after this keynote. Thank you very much, Audrey. Please enjoy every word. Hello and greetings. Uh, I'm Audrey Tang, Taiwan's Digital Minister in charge of social innovation. And I'm really, really happy to be here um, to share with you some thoughts around digital social innovation. Now, um, if you see um, a cute dog, and I hope you do see a cute dog, um, that means that the presentation is working. Uh, and this is our main way uh, of countering the pandemic in Taiwan uh, with no lockdown and countering the infodemic uh, with no takedown. This dog, uh, the name is Zong Chai, is a Shiba Inu, and the dog lives with the participation officer or the PO of the Ministry of Health. You see, in each of our 32 ministries, we have a team of people who engage emerging hashtags. That is to say, just like media officers uh, respond to journalists and the parliamentary officers respond to the MPs, the hashtag officers, our POs, engage what's happening in the here and now when people have anything to say about democracy. So instead of just you know, three bits per person every four years uploaded, which is called voting. Uh, anyone in Taiwan can pick up the phone and essentially talk to the spokes dog. Uh, this is how we communicate our physical distancing rules. When you're indoors, uh, keep three Shiba Inus away. When you're outdoors, keep two of them away. Remember to cover your mouth and nose when sneezing and wear a mask. But why would you wear a mask? Because a mask pr protects your own face against your own unwashed hands. And this is what we call humor over rumor. 
This ensures that the scientific information, the clarifications spread faster than rumors. And each and every citizen can just pick up the phone. There's a phone called 1922 um, and just ask to their heart's content about anything related to counter pandemic and infodemic. Um, just in last years alone, there's more than 2 million calls placed. Last April, there was a young boy who called saying, hey, you're rationing out mask. And all I get was pink medical mask. Well, the boys in my class, he said, all have navy blue ones. I don't want to wear pink to school. Well, the very next day in the 2 p.m. press conference, the daily press conference where all the journalist questions are answered, Minister of Health and all the medical officers at a request of the participation officer wore pink. And so after that, pink became the most trending color. The Minister of Health even said Pink Panther was his childhood hero. So the boy became the most hip boy in the class for only he has the color that the heroes wear and the hero's hero, I guess, wear. And so this fast response ensures a collective intelligence that takes care of people without leaving anyone behind, without divisiveness, without the polarization on social media and such. We also make sure that we work with a shadow government, um, so-called GovZero or G0V. You see, in each and every digital service in Taiwan, which all ends is something that GOV.TW, there's a bunch of people, civic hackers, that always uh, watch what digital service doesn't do well or do right, and they, instead of complaining, demonstrate. Demonstrate as in demo. So building alternate websites using the same domain but always uh, in a more fun and open source way and using something that G0V.TW. So just changing an O to a zero in the browser bar gets you into the shadow government that's always relinquishing the copyright also so that in the future when people accept that, hey, this is actually working better, we can always merge it back into what we call a people-public partnership or reverse procurement. One case uh, in, to note is that uh, last February, um, there's a bunch of people in Tainan City uh, who noticed that the uh, masks were in short supply. And so they coded up a map that displays the um, availability of masks using crowdsourcing reports. And because I'm part of the GovZero collective, I noticed this work and then I talked to the premier head of our cabinet saying, we need to trust citizens with open data because in Taiwan, data could be published as soon as it collected. And because we have broadband as a human right, any corner in Taiwan, you're guaranteed to have 10 megabits per second for just 15 euros a month. Otherwise, it's my fault. Uh, you can call me personally. Uh, and so using this available infrastructure, we made sure that when we're rationing out the mask in more than 6,000 pharmacies, each and every pharmacy updates every 30 seconds, like a distributed ledger, to more than 100 different tools built by the social sector so that people who queue in line can see that people using the national health card which protects not just citizens but residents uh, in line and then they can swipe the card and they see the real-time availability of masks actually depleting uh, while they're queuing and so they don't have to to queuing vain, and we get three quarter of people wearing masks and washing hands in all districts in Taiwan by April and after which uh, we move on more or less uh, to a post-pandemic lifestyle. And so um, the point here is not just about the fair distribution, it's also about crowdsourcing. What does it mean to be fair? For example, um, there's independent analysis being built at the time by people from the OpenStreetMap community. And the community realized that even though it looks fair on the map, uh, on a distance point of view, however, um, according to the OpenStreetMap community, if you zoom out a little bit, then suddenly we discovered that in the rural places, it's actually the time cost to reach pharmacies is not um, as short as in the urban areas. So this MP, uh, the VP of Data Analytics in Foxconn before joining the parliament, MP Gao interpolated Minister Chen saying what's fair is actually biased, uh, it has a Taipei bias. But uh, Minister Chen didn't defend the policy, but rather said, hey, uh, legislator, teach us. And then we co-created the pre-ordering system as well as the new distribution system in just 24 hours, again, in a evidence-based co-creation. 
And so this uh, seems to speak to Dr. Tsai Ing-wen, our president's inauguration speech in 2016, where she said, before we think of democracy as showdown between opposing values, but now we must think of democracy as a conversation between many diverse values. And you're looking at the Social Innovation Lab. It's my office. Every Wednesday, any social innovator can book 40 minutes of my time to talk about anything uh, that they wish to talk. The only thing I ask in return is that the conversation that we had must be published to the Commons after 10 days of co-editing as a transcript or as a uh, video under Creative Commons attribution license. And so the nature of conversation changes. It's always centered around the sustainable goals because the future generations, in a sense, are in the room too. The live streaming um, or the transcripts or the tape recorder stands for the people who will look at our conversation in the future. So always when people introduce new emergent ideas to me, they always make a case that also benefits future generations simply because it will look quite bad if they make uh, a proposition that only benefits this generation at the expense of future generations. And so the digitalization is not just about the development of technologies, but also making sure the innovation and the governance are inclusive, meaning that we must leave no one behind. And so every year we have a presidential hackathon hosted in the Social Innovation Lab. And the top five teams that won the trophy from our president, Dr. Tsai Ing-wen, gets their ideas amplified within one year. So for example, the water saviors team detects water leakage because we've had no typhoons last year. This is actually very important so that we can plug the pipes in real time. They co-created this uh, map with the assistive intelligence or AI and collective intelligence. And so uh, they shortened the time it takes to detect the water leakage from two months uh, to two days. And again, this co-creation just won the trophy, which is a micro projector. If you turn it on, it projects Dr. Tsai Ing-wen handing you the trophy. So it's meta, it's a self-describing trophy. And the five teams that won the trophy each year basically gets a presidential guarantee that their idea of data collaboratives will become national digital public infrastructure within the next year. And that's how we get a lot of the infrastructure from the civil society into the public sector, but still maintained by the civil society, such as the air pollution map that has been repurposed to, well, the mask availability map, but also so water resource map and many other maps as well. And so this idea of a civil IoT system shows that it's not just about the state or the surveillance capitalist gathering data. Rather, all these um, dots that you see here are in the primary schools. It's part of basic education where we teach not literacy, but competence. In a democratic polity with broadband as a human right, it's no longer um, the same with radio and television, where the students are merely watching or reading, um, where they uh, just um, are creative or critical to the existing stories. Rather, they tell their own stories, becoming their own data stewards and have access to um, fact check the presidential debates or start their own presidential hackathon idea and all in all having the access to the computational facilities that power such infrastructure. And so when it comes to social media, we're not as afraid of the anti-social corner of social media to disrupt democracy because part of our infrastructure, polis.gov.tw, is a pro-social social media built by the free software community and hosted um, in our um, national infrastructure. So we understand the cybersecurity and the privacy guarantees are to be trusted. And so this is the place where we have not national deliberations on, for example, the Uber X case in 2015, where people, instead of arguing what's platform economy, what's gig economy, what's sharing economy, instead concentrated on what do you feel about the facts? 
that people crowdsourced. And there's no right or wrong about feelings. For each new fact, I can feel happy, they can feel angry, and it's all okay. But after three weeks of letting people voice the feelings and resonate with one another, almost magically, the feelings coalesce into a convergent whole, what we call a rough consensus. And so the experience is like you see a fellow citizen's feeling. I feel liability insurance for passenger is very important. Well, if you agree, then you move toward me on this map. And if you d disagree, then you move farther away from me on this map. But there is no reply button, so there is no room for troll to grow. And we designed a system such that this headcount does not affect the area. If you get 2,000 people voting exactly the same way, well, you may see an extra zero here, but the shape does not change. For the only agenda that's binding from this consultation must be cross the aisle, meaning all the four groups must be um, agreeing on it. It must be a super majority. And so while people agree to disagree on a few divisive statements, by and large, People agree with most their neighbors on most of the items most of the time. And so because of this, uh, everybody can see that the insurance, the registration, not undercutting existing meters and so on, uh, are what the entire society, including Uber drivers and taxi drivers, feel uh, the same. And so we then hold all the stakeholders to account and build the multi-purpose taxi regulation. Uber is now a just regular taxi fleet in Taiwan, the Q taxi, but we then revamped the taxi rules to allow for surge pricing, app-based discussion, and so on, so that the co-ops and many social sector people, even local churches and temples, can operate a Uber-like service so that it's a people-public-private partnership with the people setting the norm first via such online consultation forms. So this is still KPI, but the key performance um, indicators are crowdsourced. Crowdsourced agenda setting, I think, is the key to make democracy a form of social technology that everybody can add in without distracting one another. And so um, as a concluding remark, I would like to share my job description. Back in 2015, uh, when I was uh, running this uh, V-Taiwan police uh, consultations, the SDGs are being deliberated in the UN. And I really like the SDGs and how it unifies the visions of the three sectors together. And so when I become digital minister in 2016 and the HR asked me, hey, minister, what, what do you mean by digital minister? I never had a digital minister. And I was so inspired. I said, well, the digital minister's job is just 17, 18, reliable data, 17, 17, effective partnerships, 17, 6, open innovation. And the uh, uh, HR people said, you know, I don't think the Taiwanese population have memorized all 169 um, SDG goals. You have to explain in plain language. And so uh, that's when I translated that into a poem or a prayer, and I call myself a poetician ever after. So this is my job description. When we see the Internet of Things, let's make it an Internet of Beings. When we see virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. When we see machine learning, let's make it collaborative learning. When we see user experience, let's make it about human experience. And whenever we hear that a singularity is near, let us always remember the plurality is here. Thank you for listening. Let's work on democracy as a technology together and I look forward to the questions. Audrey, thank you so much for this opening keynote. This is so perfect to start because it gives really a big picture also on the potential of the empowerment and to take it in your own hands. And this is what we really want to have. So you are bridging it fantastically. Thank you so much. I would like to see if there are any questions from the audience which will be sent to me through technology also. You know, it is also like crowdsourcing questioning here. Um, and while waiting for questions, I can already start because I, I have one personal question. I recently saw you talk with Yuval Ara recently um, about uh, the future of democracy and at some point uh, Yuval is suggesting that technology may be able to hack human beings. 
And my question to you is, I mean, when we talk about all this empowerment and people and doing and, and, and tech and access to tech and etc., what is, do you think that we will be um, uh, hacking human beings ourselves? Certainly. Um, I think what Yuval Harari's point was that many technologies bring the power from the edges into the centers. That is to say, previously, the people-to-people -people relationships depend on a certain norms, but those norms may be disrupted in the form of disruptive technology, and the norms will be asked to give way to technologies. That's my understanding of his position. And my response is that it could be done the other way too. We can empower people closest to the pain with the universal broadband, universal health care, the access to assistive intelligence, not authoritarian intelligence as human right and so on. We can empower people who are closest to the field to basically appropriate existing technology, become appropriate technologies. Um, and so I have in my mind, for example, there was a um, call to 1922 last year, last April, uh, and the caller said, I tried out the traditional rice cooker, and it seems that uh, if you don't add water to it, it can kill the virus but it doesn't kill the mask. So that the mask, which were at the time still in short supply, could be reused two or three times uh, without uh, getting uh, the need to be renewed and so on, essentially tripling our mask supply. Now, this is a really good idea. It's been replicated. Um, our minister Chen even tried it out on the uh, live streamed press conference and it also reached many people. I translated it to many different languages, but I'm sure that the traditional rice cooker makers did not have this use in mind. And I have in my mind all the open source, open data and open algorithms that the society is producing so that if we make sure that our digital infrastructure is built in such a way that anyone who gets affected it by it has the whereabout, has the competence to change it, then I think we can collectively hack the democratic institutions and polities for the better. If on the other hand, the uh, right access, the commit rights is restricted to uh, just a few people, then Harari may, may well be right because then uh, we are all read only while just a few people equipped with hacking rights eventually determine the destiny of many other people. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I'm just uh, checking again. Uh, people, you can actually write your questions in the chat. We have great chat moderators and you can uh, write your questions. It is uh, for uh, the accredited people, I think, and they can actually like bring this up to me on this stage. So I am also uh, in a participant participative democratic experiment here and I try to bring it to you uh, uh, Audrey. Um, just another question, you said you are also an artist but it is it goes beyond the poetry. I think it is absolutely uh, genius to have uh, translated the 169 measures you had into poetry um, uh, like haiku so to speak. Um, do you, are you an artist also beyond this yourself and uh, do you have time to do art yourself? Yes, um, so I call myself a poetician. So a lot of my work is just to write, as you said, haikus, either writing it myself or translating, like from the uh, great poet uh, Lao Tzu, uh, the Dao De Jing, uh, which I draw a lot of inspiration from. And I, I think it's also to get some like short snippets, like boiling down the idea of digital social innovation to fast, fair and fun which I just share with you. And so that anything that's fast, fair and fun may spread better. These are the components that make the ideas worth spreading spread. Or the idea of humor over rumor, that's another short uh, snippet that says if uh, the outrage and polarization drives people's behavior on the more anti-social corner of social media, then using humor, especially self-deprecating humor, it actually spreads even faster as I demonstrated with a very cute Shiva Inu dog. Which is actually, by the way, my favorite dog. <laughs> so I love Shiba Inu. So I was like, oh, this is so cute, obviously. And everybody's like feeling trust, as you were saying. 
Audrey, it was really wonderful to have you with us. And I'm so glad you were opening the conference. Thank you so much. I wish you a good evening in uh, uh, Taiwan, uh, where you are right now. Uh, thank you again. And I hope to see you soon to a next conference. And uh, we will all check what you're doing over there, right? Thank you. Live long and prosper, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye.